quick bit of uh, introductory information. The much of the information that you're seeing today, and with the presenters have done a superb job of tying this together. So we're really pleased to be able to do this for you. Is based upon a, a recent research report from the Mount Cuba Center. The Mount Cuba Center provides these research reports in order to improve uh, the understanding of native plants and how best to plant, use native plants to improve uh, in our, our local uh, environment. The research report itself is about 16 pages, but you can see, and this is downloadable from the website, a lot of good information about how to plant them, where to plant them, and uh, their, uh, what type of pollinators they, they uh, attract and how to, um, how to resolve some of the problems with uh, uh, mildew and other, other uh, uh, diseases. I hope you can still see mine. Oh. Can you still see that? Yes. It's just yeah. a first. Thank you. Sorry. So with no further ado, let's uh, let's get into the discussion. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Laura Helm, who's going to uh, talk about the selection and planting of Monarda. Monarda. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Steve. Um, so um, Monarda, it's uh, also known as bee balm, it's a common name. Um, I had a friend that got some of this at a native plant sale and put it in her garden and it was so fabulous. I went and bought a couple and put it in my garden. Uh, the flowers are just beautiful when they bloom. Um, so go ahead, Steve, to the next, next slide. Okay, so what is Monarda? It's a native perennial. So once you get it going, it'll come back every year. It has bright flowers that bloom in the peak of summer. Uh, the shades of color are from pink to red to purple to lavender. They're all different shades from, from pink through purple. And it's just a lovely crown of petals um, and very attractive to pollinators. So just a little background. It was named for a Spanish botanist named Nicholas Monardis. And he wrote a book about North American plants back in 1571. So we've known about this for a long time. It's, it is a native to this area. And Monarda was known to have medicinal properties for, for the to the Native Americans. They used it. And one, one of those things was they would crush the leaves to soothe pain. And so the, uh, it's the likely source of the name bee balm is the using the leaves to, uh, for bee, bee stings. So it's called, used, used, the common name is bee balm. Okay, next. Steve? Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so some characteristics of this. It is a member of the mint family, so it has square stems and opposite leaves on the, on the stem. Um, the foliage is fragrant, and it has a spreading habit that uses rhizomes that grow underground and spread. Uh, so the spread must be controlled, and it may need to be divided and replanted every three to five years. So be cautious putting this in. If you're familiar with mint, you know that it spreads. Uh, some, some varieties are more aggressive than others, but um, just be aware that it's going to spread out. Maybe if you want to fill an area, that makes it great. But if you don't, then you need to make sure you keep it confined. So the flowers could be a single flower head, or it might be stacked, like this one in the picture. Um, the flowers typically last about three weeks, and it's an herbaceous perennial, so the top growth dies back in the fall, and then it'll come back the next year. Next. Okay, I just thought I'd go over some of the varieties to show you some of the different uh, selections that are available. There's many different varieties of color and size. Um, I use a lot of this came from the study by the Mount Cuba Center. And it, it came up, it analyzed many different varieties and came up with some that they recommended for various reasons. So these are some of the ones that, just a few of the varieties that are available. So Claire Grace, it has this purple floral uh, display that's just beautiful. It, it does have some resistance to the powdery mildew, which is a common problem that Alicia's gonna talk about. And this one has glossy green foliage. 
the uh, Grand Marshal is deep red purple and it's a compact, so it's only 28 inches tall. So when you have a small area, that might be a good choice. Okay, next. The Dark Ponticum. This one is violet purple flowers. It has nearly 100% coverage over the plant, so it's really great. And it has dark bluish green leaves. Um, and this one is that's attractive to bees. All of these are attractive to pollinators that Effie's gonna talk about later, but um, this one has got a lot of, very attractive for bees. Then we have one that, that's, uh, there's three that are very, very similar. So they kind of grouped together, the Judas Fancy Fuchsia, the Chlorine Red and Raspberry Wine. These are really tall, 44 to 48 inches tall and have an abundance of large purplish red flowers. Um, the Judas has a slightly better resistance. And then I showed the picture of the On Parade, which is very similar to these others, but it has orchid flowers, but it's similar height um, and size growth habits. But all of those are, you know, I mean, to me, I think they're all beautiful. <laughs> so go ahead and go on to the next. <laughs> okay, a couple more. Uh, purple Rooster, this one has true purple flowers, uh, but it has the dull green uh, sandpapery leaves for a background. Uh, this one is very resistant to mildew and it has very upright and rigid stems, so it stands up really well. Um, the Gr Garden View Scarlet, this one has really big four inch wide flowers, uh, 36 inches tall, and they're a true red. Um, this one actually attracts hummingbirds and it's resistant to pottery mildew. Um, go ahead to the next. So some planty guidance. Uh, these flowers prefer the full sun to partial shade, and they need moist, well-drained soil. You can't let them get too dried out. Uh, if, they, if they get stressed, that's going to lead to diseases, like Alicia's going to talk about. Um, it, can be, it can be aggressive. If you don't want it to spread, you need to surround it with other very strong plants or grow it in a container. Uh, the the Didyama is the most aggressive and Fistulosa and Bradburiana are a little bit slower to spread. So if you, you don't want it to spread too much, those might be better choices. So in the spring, you'd use a shovel to cut the underground rhizomes to prevent spreading. You just go around it with the shovel and then you can pull out any plants. They have shallow roots. So if you trim around the edge of it and pull out the shoots, then um, that'll help keep it from spreading. Um, you wanna divide it late in the summer or fall. Once you get up mass of it. Uh, it might get an area in the middle that starts to die out. So that's you know, time that when you, you need to break it up, up and, and replant. So just you know, cut it with a shovel and, and move some plants out and spread it out a little bit. So about every three to five years you may need to do that. Okay, next. So enjoy your marandas. This is a the spreading habit is an asset if you want to fill a large area with a native perennial that attracts pollinators. It's a great choice for that, that situation. Um, you can combine it with other strong, vigorous plants next to it, and that'll help keep the spreading in check. Um, some other tall perennials and grasses are very good companions for bee balm. Uh, try to choose the disease resistant varieties to avoid pallidity mildew, which is a very common problem. Um, Alicia is going to talk about this, but when you're looking at the different varieties, you might want to check on that and make sure that's um, something that, if that's something you're worried about, make sure you check on that. So these beautiful flowers, they have all sizes and colors. Uh, they're just a beautiful display in the garden and they provide food for our pollinators. So they're, there's a really good choice for native plant gardens. Uh, this, all this, this photos and information, the photos from this are all from the Mount Cuba report, uh, which uh, Steve talked about at the beginning. Um, and, and that's it, just for background on Monardas. Well, that's a great introduction. Thanks, Laura, for that. And, and uh, now that we've got the context set, uh, I'll ask uh, Alicia to take it over from here and talk specifically about the, uh, the powdery mildew, mildew problem with uh, Monarda. My name is Alicia Garrison, and I'm a second year intern with the uh, the uh, Fairfax County Master Gardener um, Program, um, which is under Virginia Cooperative Extension, uh, Virginia Tech. And I'm gonna talk about powdery mildew on bee balm or Monarda. Okay, next slide. 
Next slide. Okay. Um, if the way you know that you have a mildew problem is you see the white spots on the uh, leaf right here. That's like the beginning. Um, it's on the upper part of the leaf. Um, and sometimes you'll see the tiny black brown spheres um, may be visible um, within the white spots later in the season. Um, they usually start on the lower leaves and the reason being is that this is a problem that is definitely um, made worse or caused by high humidity. You know, when the summer starts getting, the temperatures go up and humidity goes up, um, this, this problem, you know, increases. Um, this, and I'll have pictures of severely infected leaves I have some zinnias now that I haven't treated and almost every leaf is covered with this grayish white fungi. Um, and eventually the, the leaves will turn brown and fall off. Um, sometimes you'll see curling or twisted and turn yellow due to the infection. Um, next slide. It's, it's very, it's a common fungal disease on Monarda. Um, and the spores will overwinter in garden debris and, and also spread by the way, by the wind. Um, it also affects other plants like lilacs, roses, zinnias, which I'm having a terrible problem flocks and peonies. Um, and as you'll see on the picture right here, your leaves will be covered with grayish white powdery. It looks powdery and severely infected leaves will drop prematurely. Um, usually, unless it's and you know extensive, um, it won't kill the plant. It won't affect its overall health but it looks pretty awful. Um, it's more severe in overcrowded plants and plants grown in partial shade. Um, and you can control powdery mildew through appropriate cultural practices, which I'll explain on the next slide. Um, fungicides are usually not needed um, but if you are going to use it, um, do it early in the season when the spots first appear and remove infected leaves. Don't put it in your compost because you don't want it to, you know, use that compost on, in your garden and the spores will come with the compost and you'll infect other plants. Put them in the garbage. Um, as far as fungicides, I like using the oil-based. Um, I have one that's bee safe and um, it's made of sesame oil. Um, and just make sure if you, if you buy this um, to uh, follow the directions on the, you know, the information that's, you know, on the product. Um, it's good to read it you know, even before you buy it. Um, but just follow directions carefully for its use. Um, if the majority of the leaves have powdery mildew, like in this picture here, it may be too light, late to treat and you should just remove the whole plant and put them in the trash. Um, next slide. Okay, here's some of the cultural practice I mentioned. Um, you should plant in a place that gets at least six hours of sun each day. Um, ensure you have good, moist, rich organic matter in your soil. Um, space the plants at least two or two and a half uh, feet apart. Um, mulch the soil around the plants with wood chips or other organic mulch. And ensure that the soil doesn't dry out. Um, keep it uniformly moist. 
and um, avoid watering the leaves. I take my hose, and unless you have a drip hose, which is ideal, um, I take my hose and put it on just a little stream of water and put it right at the base of the plant um, to water my plants. Um, and also um, don't water at night where, you know, the, the moist, dark, you know, it, it'll, it'll make the mildew spread. Um, early morning is best to water your plants. Um, remove and destroy uh, disease infested plant debris. Um, but this says in the fall, I, oh yeah, the whole plant, you know, get rid of it so it doesn't overwinter. Um, but you can all season long, you can remove the infected leaves. Um, divide the plants every two to three years to avoid overcrowding. Next slide. Okay, this was mentioned before. Um, the best way to avoid the annoying problem of powdery mildew is to select mildew resistant varieties. And some of these were mentioned earlier. Um, there's Marshall's Delight, Garden View Scarlet, Coleraine Red, Violet Queen, and Raspberry Wine. Very beautiful. Um, beautiful colors, a wide range of colors. And I love, you know, the shape of the plant, you know, the spikiness and everything. I think it's beautiful. My mom used to have it. I never remember her having any mildew. I don't know what she did, but I don't remember her doing anything. So... She was lucky, I guess. Um, next slide. Okay, these are my references. Um, uh, next, Effie Shaw is going to talk about the pollinators that love uh, Monarda. Over to you, Effie. Okay, so there's lots of different pollinators that love Monarda. And if you go out in the summer, you'll see it just covered. The picture on the left here is from my garden. The right one is not. All right, next slide. So I found this study that was done at Penn State that I thought was really interesting. Um, out of all the pollinators that they observed over a few years time, they found Monarda fitulosa was in the top 10. All the plants were they were known to be used as pollinators, uh, but this one was in the top 10. And then Monarda Peter's Fancy Fuchsia and Monarda Punctata Spotted Bee Bomb were in the top 20. So the difference between any of them was small. If you look at the list, it's there's not that much difference, but they are still ranged. So I thought it was interesting that they found themselves in this list of uh, pollinators from Penn State. All right, next slide. As it, co um, its common name refers to bees and the, the, the bee, the, the plant is used as a bomb, but it also attracts the bees. So the name um, tells us multiple things about bees. So it attracts many types of bees and more. Two types of specialist bees are rare, but found in Virginia. And the one on the right is one of the specialist bees. And I have their scientific names here, Perdita gerardia and Protandrina um, abdominalis. So I thought that was interesting that we have two of those here in the state of Virginia. And then of the bees that it attracts, which are many, bumblebees and honeybees are two more. Next slide. And some of the other ones that I found that were attracted uh, to the bee bomb are potter's wasp and the hawk moth and many types of butterflies, many, many types of butterflies. And next slide. This particular type, the scarlet monarda, uh, primarily attracts fritillaria, and, but it also attracts the ruby-throated hummingbirds. So I thought it was interesting that certain species will attract particular types of butterflies um, and others 
would attract multiple types of butterflies, but the Fritillaria primarily likes the Scarlet Monaga. And next slide. This a tiny little sweat bee has only been found on Monarda. All right, and let's see if I have one more slide. And because when you go out in the summertime and, and observe your plant, it will just be covered. And you can stand there and just count all different species that are on it. So I said that it is a native superstar in the pollinator garden. And I do like the fact that it does attract other birds. So there are birds that, that come to it, like the finches and um, the hummingbirds, and particularly when it's flowering. The finches now when the flowers are more dead. All right, and I think that was all that I had here. All right, it was, fu it was fun looking at all the pictures of the different pollinators on the plant, so pretty fun.